Hey, Jim Gavigan again with Industrial Insight. So I wanted to continue expounding on some of the ideas I talked about in my last video blog. We were talking about some of the data extraction methods out of Pi to do more advanced investigations. So I want to get into some more of the details of some of those things and, and really you know, help you understand some of the thought processes we go through and give you some things to think about. So like I said, one of the first passes we do is we take some just sampled or interpolated data for uh, our initial investigations. So that has pluses and minuses to it. So from a plus standpoint, you know, I can, I can set up a data link spreadsheet. I mean, there's tons of YouTube videos on how to, you know, set up a, a sampled call, but it, it's fairly simple. You know, it's, you know, you go into Pi Data Link, you know, tell it that you want sample data and you get this little, you know, window over here on the right side that tells you how to set it up. So here I wanted to get pretty much a year and a half's worth of data at a five minute interval. And I don't remember how many tags that I have on here. So what I could do is then just, you know, hit apply. And what it's going to do is fill down, um, you know, these values. If it's not a compressed value, it's going to give me an interpolated value between the last two data points. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's not so good. More times than not for what we're trying to do, it's okay. Uh, one of the other potential extracts you can do here is to actually do a calculated data field. So you might want to do, you know, um, an average, a five minute average of something. And I'm gonna link in the comments below on this on the YouTube side is a, the presentation that Rick Smith gave last year uh, in 2018 at Pi World, where he talked about feeding the machine learning monster. And when they were doing some five minute average data or one minute average data or you know data of any average, and you have a, a really high data density or a varying data density on a bunch of tags, you know what that can do to you and this is the reason why he built his tool which I, I told you I couldn't really give any details of he gives probably more details than than I can give anyway uh, in that presentation so I'll link that below but he really talks about you know the the challenge of you know data density and doing these long data pulls to, to feed these algorithms and why data link you know really didn't help him the way he wanted to I, I think data links a great tool for what it does you know, for very quick ad hoc investigations for fairly small data sets, it works wonders, you know, and does a lot of the calculations for you. So it, it, it's a beautiful tool. It's just not meant for, you know, some of the things we're doing now, um, you know, in 2019, when Datalink was invented, it, it was really built as an ad hoc, quick kind of a reporting tool. So we're really kind of pushing its limits. So that's the reason why sometimes I use it to start with, and then I find, you know, I need some kind of a, a custom data extract tool. So we, we use those things, which our, our friend has so graciously shared with us. So we can do, you know, really long data pulls for really wide data sets. So that's, that's one thing that, that we do. And so what does that give us? So I'm going to show a little investigation I did in Tableau for a paper company that I thought was, was kind of interesting. So I'm going to go ahead and, and select kind of all their production metrics here. And then they have a, a quality metric that we were looking at as well. So one of the things that they told us was for the this quality metric, if you see a really big number in it, we know why that happens. You can filter it out if it's above, you know, say 15 or 20. We know that number is false. So one of the things we could do, you know, is we could start to say, okay, well, if it's below, if it's above 20, it's filtered out of my data set. I don't even want it in there. Now, if you notice, you know, it's drawing some kind of funny lines. You saw some holes pop up on there, you know, as I'm uh, drawing this out, you know, you see the holes start to fill in like right there. There's one on that top graph, you know, kind of toward the right side of the screen. And what it's going to do is it's just going to draw a line right in that hole. So, you know, it can kind of fool you as to, to what it is you're looking at. One of the other things, you see this big drop off uh, in the data. What that, I knew what that was when I first looked at it. I said, well, that's probably a planned down day and they actually shut the machine down. 
So I said, okay, I'm going to take, there, there's a, an indicator that tells me if the machine's running or not. So I'm going to make it where that indicator tells me that, yes, in fact, they're running. So now what it does is it draws kind of some funny lines. So you see from like November 13th, say about 11.45 a.m. through November 14th at 12.35 a.m., you know, I don't have any data readings there. So, but here's what I want you to think about is I'm essentially doing an event frame like investigation right here. I only want to know if this quality metric is below this number and when they're running. So I'm filtering out all of the data to, you know, do an investigation, you know, for them, you know, with actual data that I care about. So again, this started with just an interpolated, you know, 5, 10, 15 minute, you know, interval where I wanted to look at some things, you know, to get a, an idea of what was going on to see if we needed to build a further investigation. Hey, is there anything interesting? You know, may, maybe we figure out this data point is, is moving a lot in that 5, 10, 15 minutes and we need to maybe take an average of it or maybe we need to use less tags and a, and a higher fidelity sampling rate. So you can do these kinds of investigations right off the bat, you know, just with those kind of, of, of data pools. So another thing that we did was we actually, we looked at some batch digesters as well. And one of the things that people tend to ignore in a lot of these data tools is that if you look over here on the right, you see this little hierarchical kind of a structure. I can actually build a hierarchical structure inside of Power BI or Tableau that when I refresh the data, that structure stays intact. So here I took, I think, five minute data for maybe 50 variables for about four years and said, I want to see how this has an effect. And, and if you look at the Digester Journal, that's all event frame data. So I've taken, you know, a snapshot of what happened during this event frame, you know, at, at the end, basically, at, ba at the end of a, a digester cook. But what I did was then I said, well, I want to understand that, that there was a theory that the subject matter expert that I was working with said, you know what, Jim, I, I wonder what's going on with some of our valving. And so we decided, okay, let's, let's, take a look at those. Well, I didn't want to go back and add it to the event frame, backfill all those data points. I said, you know what, with Power BI or Tableau, I can start to merge data sets and start to overlay things from several different data sets. And what I did was able to put them in a hierarchical structure because what this looked like was, I think I had the desuperheater stuff too. I think I had five or six tags with it. But now if you look at it, I took the pie tag descriptions and lump them under each one of the digesters and, and rename these hierarchical structures the, the digester that they, they need to be. So now I can actually kind of take an AF-like approach where I, I have everything kind of in a hierarchical structure, you know, for just this report, and I can kind of look at it in a, in a little different manner. So again, I took you know, the just a, a data link pull because this was able to do it. And actually, maybe I even used Rick's tool or, or something like that. I don't remember if I, you know, and maybe I used a, a different data extract tool. I, I, I can't remember. It's uh, It's been a little while since I've, I've done this. But the thing that I wanted to show you was that sometimes, you know, if you take that first pass, get it out into the, the row column format, you can actually use some of the business intelligence tools to tell you a lot more than what you think. So that's that's usually a typical first approach, you know, on that. Now, one of the other things that I did as well. So one of the other investigations that we did was we wanted to to take a look at getting some baselines for a particular piece of equipment for a customer. And what we ended up doing here was we actually used the, the, and I did the video blog, you know, about Pi Analytics and how sometimes the simple analytics can really help you. Well, what we did was we took the simple uh, daily averages, or I think, yeah, I think it was daily averages here. Uh, let me look here. Yeah, we just took the compressed data for their daily averages and I put in the different date ranges, 
that I needed because it was a little bit different for each piece of equipment when it was running well. So I wanted enough data to give me, you know, what was the daily average when this was running actually really well, because that's what I want my baseline to be. So, you know, again, our data extract techniques are, are slightly different. These are all the simple ones. So the next video, I'm going to talk about some of the things that we can do with PyOLIDB Enterprise. Then the next video after that, I'll talk about the, the integrator for business analytics and what that delivers for you. So hopefully this gives you some of this more simple data extracts and what you can do when you're first trying to investigate certain problems. So hopefully this helps and, and gives you a little bit more detail.